everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today has been on the show before, but she has a brand new book, and it's fabulous. It's called The Anti-Viral Gut. Her name is Dr. Robin Shutkin, and please welcome her back to the show. Congratulations on such a fabulous book. Thank you, AJ, and it's so great to be back with you. I just have to show everyone that I'm wearing this fantastic t-shirt that says dirt, sweat, veg that you made me the last time I was on the show and I absolutely love it. And as you said, it's sort of my, uh, my battle cry, dirt, sweat, veg. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And I, again, thank you. And it was so fun to design it with that font and it looks fantastic on you. It's a fantastic color and congratulations on the new book. I, I have the book, but I also thank listened you. to it on audible and I'm curious what drove you to write this book and did you write it before or after or during the pandemic? I wrote it during AJ and the motivation was pretty simple. We were all, you know, glued to our televisions, watching all this terrifying stuff. And I think our government did a pretty good job. It's always easy to look back with a retrospective scope, but I think we did a fairly good job about educating people about public health measures like social distancing and mask wearing and vaccination and hand washing. But I didn't hear anybody really talking about something that is very complementary to all those things and really important, which is the idea of the host of the health of the host and the idea that host health matters and what we can do individually to improve our internal terrain, our gut soil, so that we can be more resilient to viruses and have better outcomes if and when we do become infected. So, you know, as I watch the news reports and the death numbers and everybody talking about all this scary stuff, I really realized that nobody was talking about these incredible gut defenses that can help keep us well. And while people think about the gut as a digestive organ, like people really weren't thinking about it as a defensive organ. So I wanted to do some education around that. Well, I thought it was fascinating that you said that the health of the host matters more than the virulence of the pathogen. That's mind blowing. It, it really is. And it really is this sort of um, melding, if you will, AJ, of two really important medical concepts, both by Frenchmen. So the first is germ theory, which we know was popularized by Louis Pasteur. And germ theory says that a bad bug gets into your body and makes you sick. And that's absolutely true. That's We see that with Ebola, with HIV, with SARS-CoV-2. These are all pathogens that get into our body and make us sick. But another Frenchman, Antoine Béchamp, championed something called terrain theory. And what he proposed is that if your soil, and by the soil, we're really talking about the gut microbiome, the gut lining, the immune system. If that soil is healthy, the seed, in this case, a germ can pass relatively harmless, harmlessly through your body without really causing a lot of disruption. So without you ending up on a ventilator in the ICU with post-viral symptoms, et cetera. And that is also true. And the interesting thing, AJ, is that we see that with every condition, we see that people who are healthier do better with cancer, with stroke, with heart disease, with whatever it is. It's not just viral illnesses, but I think people weren't thinking about that. And I think there was so much fear and terror of like, what's going to happen if I get this virus? And so I wanted people to understand that these poor outcomes, while sometimes they do sort of fall from the sky, a lot of the time they are predictable or forecastable, and they are reducible and to give people some really practical tools for how they can do that. Wow. Well, why is it, Dr. Chutkin, that two people can be exposed to the exact same virus, one can get it, one doesn't get it, one maybe recovers, one doesn't recover? Yeah, those are really factors that have to do with the host, not the virus. So AJ, if we think about a virus like Ebola, which is sort of a scary virus for good reason, it has a high fatality rate. Ebola is only able to infect one out of every three adults it comes into contact with. Two out of three people exposed to Ebola will not become infected. A much lower percentage of children will become infected. If we think about another relatively scary virus, one that was old that's new again, which is poliovirus, which is an RNA virus similar to coronavirus, we know that in one out of every 200 people, point. 5% or is that 0.05% my mathematically my mathematic genius daughter will be very disappointed in me that is that 0.05 or 0.5 but um uh, in one out of every 200 people that 
polio virus infects, it's able to cross the gut lining, get into the bloodstream and cause devastating paralysis. But then the other 199, that doesn't happen. They either have no symptoms whatsoever or mild symptoms and then they're done. So what we see is that these differences are not due to virulence of the virus. This is the same virus. They're due to differences in us, the host. And that is something that I think people just really weren't focused on, maybe not even aware of. So for example, in summer 2020, AJ, there was a big population-based study that was published. It was done here in the US, 53,000 people. And they asked a simple question, does being on an acid blocker, not an antacid, but a proton pump inhibitor, those drugs that are very potent that completely shut down the acid pump in your stomach, does being on one of those drugs increase your chance of coming down with COVID? And for me as a gastroenterologist, I'm like, yes, yes, of course they do, because stomach acid is one of the body's main defenses against viruses. Stomach acid unravels and denatures that viral protein when it gets in through the mouth, keeps you safe. But again, there just wasn't widespread knowledge about that. I mean, even in the medical community, a lot of my medical colleagues, when I asked them, they were like, huh? Really? PPIs increase your risk of COVID? And that study showed that if you're on a PPI once a day, double the risk. If you're on it twice a day, three to four times increased risk. So there were things like this about the importance of stomach acid, the importance of the gut microbiome. A study from University of Massachusetts, Amherst, showing that the composition of the microbiome was the most accurate predictor of outcome from COVID. Could predict ICU admission, ventilation, death with 92% accuracy, more accurate than any comorbidities, et cetera. Um, people, the gut immune connection, people didn't really necessarily understand how the gut microbes communicate with the immune cells across the gut lining and how that works and how disruption in your gut microbiome is also really disruptive to your immune system and your ability to mount an appropriate immune response. So I really sort of felt like it was my duty, quite frankly, to do some public service announcements in the form of the book around some of these really important host defenses, primarily located in the gut. Yeah. And when you think about it, you, the uh, pro proton pump inhibitors, you, they're no longer prescription only. You, people can just get them over the counter. That's right. Scary. That is right. Because in addition to the fact that it's very difficult to leave the gastroenterologist's office without a prescription for one, you can go, you're absolutely right. Omeprazole has been over the counter for several years now. And these drugs are popular because they're very, very good at what they do. They shut down that proton potassium pump in the stomach. And that means that, you know, you can eat your greasy meal at 10 o'clock at night and you're going to have less reflux. But it's important for people to remember the reflux is there to give you that negative feedback to say, ah, uh, yeah, you know, pepperoni pizza at 10 o'clock at night, not so much. And so we need these negative and positive feedback loops in our bodies so that we kind of can move in the right direction and not do things that are harmful. And so these drugs, again, are very effective, but in addition to really messing with digestion, because they change a pH and now the digestive enzymes don't work properly, et cetera. You're not absorbing the nutrients properly. In addition to that, they remove this really, really important host defense, which is stomach acid. You know, when you think about it, you, you talked about cruises in your book, specifically the, the Diamond Princess. And a lot of people on cruises are taking PPIs because they want to be able to eat whatever they want on the cruise. I'm so glad you mentioned that because in this section on host defenses, I actually talk about another outbreak on a cruise ship, not the Diamond Princess, but this one several years ago that before the Diamond Princess was the largest viral outbreak on a cruise ship. And that was actually rotavirus and how we have seen this for decades, AJ, as long as these proton pump inhibitors have been around and they came out around when I was in medical school. So dinosaur that I am. And what we see is exactly what you're describing. When we see a viral outbreak on cruise ships, cruise ships are small, crowded places. The average stateroom is the size of about a master bathroom. And we see that even a couple sharing space together, one becomes sick, the other doesn't. They're all exposed. But who actually gets sick is typically extremes of age, the very young, the very old, the very young, the immune system is waxing, the very old, it's waning people who are on immunosuppressive medications like steroids, biologics, et cetera, and people are on acid blockers because again, they've removed that important host defense. So we have seen for decades 
that if we look at a cruise ship with 4,000 passengers, there's a viral outbreak, rotavirus, norovirus, et cetera, the 2,500 people who get sick, we can count that the PPI users are going to be amongst the ones who get sick. So if we look at something like C. diff, clostridial difficile infection, clostridium difficile infection, which is something that you can get after antibiotics, particularly if you're in the hospital or exposed to the hospital, we see again that being on a proton pump inhibitor is a big risk factor. We see for foodborne illnesses, salmonella, campylobacter, et cetera. So it's not new, but I think, again, people just weren't putting that together with COVID. So it's not just COVID that where you could have an increased risk if you're on a PPI, but all infections? All what we call enteric infections, which are gut-based infections. Wow. And the really interesting thing, AJ, is that we have about 100 times more ACE2 receptors, a receptor that, you know, binds SARS-CoV-2. We have about 100 more in the times density in the gut compared to the lungs. So the GI tract is a common portal of entry for SARS-CoV-2. And we know it binds to those intestinal cells and that's how it can get into the body. And that's why we've seen so many GI symptoms. In the early reports from Wuhan, China, we saw that essentially half of patients were having GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, constipation, pain, diarrhea, et cetera. And again, because the gut is a very important portal of entry, very important that we have intact stomach acid to help us battle it there. What is the role of stomach acid and by what mechanisms do the PPI make people more vulnerable to infection? Stomach acid is primarily, it really three purposes. The first is digestion. So it provides this optimal acidic pH at which all the other digestive enzymes, the amylase, the lipase, et cetera, they function. They need a particularly narrow pH range that's acidic to work properly. And we know that that acidic pH also stimulates peristalsis. It's involved in how the pancreas functions, et cetera and nutrient absorption. So for example, the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, they require an acidic milieu for proper absorption, vitamin B12. So digestion is focused around having this acid being released. The acid is released by cells in the GI tract in the stomach. They release, they release acid. And we also have goblet cells in the stomach that release mucus to protect the stomach lining. So it doesn't get digested by the acid. So Stomach acid is essential to digestion. And that's why, AJ, when we look at the long-term effects of these drugs, we see so many wide-ranging problems in multiple organs, in the brain, in the kidneys, in the heart, in the bones. And it's because it's messing up digestion and absorption and assimilation of nutrients. And remember, like your gut's your engine, right? So if you can't get proper food to these other organs, things are going to go awry. So digestion is number one. The second is what I talked about. It's an important defense. It is literally like, you know, your ramparts. You've got your soldiers there with the weapons drawn, ready to, to get rid of any invaders. So stomach acid is one of those important weapons. And then the third has to do with the microbiome. We know there is a very natural and important gradient when we go from north to south in the GI tract, high up in the GI tract, in the mouth and the esophagus, the stomach, the upper GI tract, we have low levels of bacteria. And as we travel down through the small intestine into the large intestine and the rectum, the amount of bacteria in the gut increases. And that gradient is also important. All the fermentation of things, et cetera, that's ideally supposed to happen low down in the colon where there are large numbers of gut bacteria. When we change the pH with these drugs, we now make the upper GI tract more alkali, more hospitable, and we disrupt that natural balance and we get overgrowth of organisms in the upper GI tract. And there was a study published in one of our GI journals in 2014 that showed that long-term use, which they defined as more than a few months at a time, of proton pump inhibitors would, was actually creating dysbiosis, imbalance in the microbiome that was equivalent to being on antibiotics for that amount of time. So really, really disruptive to the gut. Did you say in the book that about 80% of people that are taking them, it's unnecessary? Correct. Yeah. And it's higher in older people. So, you know, we, we have sort of swallowed this idea, this marketing idea that the manufacturers of these drugs have put forward that we have overproduction of stomach acid. Overproduction of stomach acid is a very rare condition called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome that most gastroenterologists will never see a case of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. 
in their entire career. I've seen several patients because when I was full-time at Georgetown, we had a dual appointment with the National Institute of Health and they had a clinic. They had a special study unit for Zollinger Ellison syndrome. And so that's why I got to see these patients, but normally it's so rare you wouldn't see it. And ZE syndrome, as we call it, involves overproduction of stomach acid. But for the vast majority, the other 99.999% of people with acid reflux, what's happening is that that lower esophageal sphincter, that muscle between the esophagus and stomach is opening inappropriately, allowing acid to come up. So the acid levels are completely appropriate. It's the muscular sphincter that's relaxing and allowing acid to be in the wrong place in the esophagus. And why is that sphincter relaxing? Well, a couple of reasons, mostly to do with overfilling the stomach, eating late at night, high fat meals, all of these things that slow down the stomach emptying and allow that valve to come up, as well as some of the things that we eat, like alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, some of these things that we ingest act chemically on that sphincter to open it up. So there's some really straightforward things that you can do, starting with eating more of your calories earlier in the day, bigger breakfast and lunch, lighter dinner, um, smaller meals in general, cutting down on the fat in your diet, cutting down on caffeine, alcohol, et cetera. These are all things that in the vast majority of people will improve reflux symptoms to the point where you're able to get off these drugs. Yeah. Thank you. One of the things you say in your book, the antiviral gut is we're only as healthy as our gut bacteria, but how do we know how healthy our gut bacteria is? Is there a test we can take? Well, it's sort of like your heart, right? If you were asymptomatic and your heart seemed to be functioning fine, you you wouldn't be going to go do a test on your heart, an echocardiogram or EKG or anything like that. It's like, my heart is good because I feel good. I can walk upstairs. I can run. I'm not having palpitations, et cetera. So the testing, the microbiome testing is really in its infancy. And while there are a lot of commercial outfits out there that will gladly take you money, they will typically send back a result, um, some sort of report that is um, not really very well rooted in science, let me say. We are not at the point where we can draw a straight line between symptoms and what's going on in the microbiome. And we can paint in general sort of broad brushstrokes. So we can say... We know that one of the most important foods for gut bacteria are what we call MACs, M-A-Cs, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Think beans and greens, legumes, whole grains, et cetera. We know from multiple scientific studies, human studies, mouse studies, et cetera. We know that variety is important. We know from the American Gut Project, a nonprofit that does do microbiome testing that I encourage people to use because it is they contribute to the general science. So they have a database that's open to researchers from all over the world, and they collect data from people from all over the world. And we know from a very important study they did in 2018, that the variety of different plants in your diet, and I know you're very familiar with this work, AJ, the magic number is 30 or more different plant foods per week is associated with a much healthier, more robust microbiome compared to fewer than 10. And for people who are sitting there going, wow, 30 plants, that sounds like a lot. Remember, it's per week, not per day. Although AJ, you probably get in 30 in a day and you get credit for fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices, whole grains, legumes. So, you know, I think about a a bowl of oatmeal and what you can do with that would maybe use almond milk to make it oats, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, raisins, blueberries, a little shaved coconut, maybe a little dollop of maple syrup. That's eight plant foods already in a bowl of oatmeal, you could probably get in 20 in a salad. So the variety is really important. And it's not so much a quantity. You know, when people say, well, how much do I need to eat? Literally, like you can eat three strawberries. It's small servings, palm of your hand, but variety, just like in the real world where variety and diversity is key and it makes us stronger and healthier as a society, we know the same is true for our gut microbes. Nice. You know, you talked about mucus in the book. What's so good about mucus? (laughs) You know, truth be told, I really liked critical care medicine, but the path to being an intensive care unit doctor is doing a pulmonary fellowship. And when I was in medical school, I hated phlegm. I was like, stool, no problem. Very interesting. Phlegm, yuck. And so I was like, yeah, I don't want to be a pulmonologist and be dealing with mucus. It turns out, AJ, that most of the mucus in the body is actually made in the gut, about one and a half liters a day, a tremendous amount. And while mucus serves as a lubricant, so it lines all the organs that are open to the outside, our mouth, our nasopharynx, our vagina, our GI tract, all these 
organs that are orifices, that are holes that you can enter. So it serves as a lubricant in the gut. It lubricates the passage for the products of digestion, but it serves another even more important role. And that is it provides a barrier to protect that thin lining. Remember that gut lining, that intestinal epithelial membrane is only one cell thick. It's a razor sharp edge and it's it doesn't have a lot of depth to it. And so the mucus provides a buffer against that lining in the gut to prevent harmful bacteria, viruses, toxins from being able to penetrate the gut lining. So it's an important protective mechanism for the gut lining. And it also does something else. It expels pathogens like SARS-CoV-2. It's this really cool cross between jello and glue, mucus, and it traps pathogens as well as toxins, like things like pollen or pollutants in the air get trapped in the mucus. And then the cilia, the hair-like projections in the lungs will move it up and then you cough it out. Or if you swallow it, your stomach acid does the rest. But mucus, it's not just a physical trapping. Mucus also has things in it called mucins, different enzymes and proteins that can actually degrade viruses. So really important to not just automatically reach for an antihistamine, a decongestant, et cetera, because those things often suppress mucus production. And you actually want that when mucus is flowing, it's because your body's trying to expel something. You know, AJ, the other day I was trying to put some mascara on, which I'm not very good at. And I was doing the mascara. And of course the mascara got in my eye. And immediately my eyes started watering like crazy within a couple seconds. And that's an example too, like my body recognized immediately that there was a foreign body in my eye and started producing additional tears to try and wash that foreign body out. And it did, it washed that mascara right out. So kind of same thing in the gut, right? When you have, or in the lungs, when you have a respiratory tract infection, or when you have a parasite or a pathogen in the gut or lungs, the body knows your immune surveillance is like, yeah. Just like the mascara in the eye, it's like, okay, SARS-CoV-2 in the gut or whatever it is, you know, pseudomonas in the lungs. And it produces extra mucus to try and move it out. And so what do we do? We suppress that mucus because we are like, oh, I'm stuffy. I don't like all this mucus. Same thing. You think about something like a fever. Fascinating to think about the fact that fever slows down viral replication. If we look at poliovirus, which is another RNA virus like SARS-CoV-2, we see that when you have a fever, the virus is replicating much slower. Poliovirus replicates 250 times faster at normal body temperature compared to when we have a fever. Again, what do we do? We reach for the Tylenol, the Motrin, the Excedrin. We drop the fever down. And in doing that, we are really allowing that virus to replicate unchecked. Not to say that you should never treat a fever, but I have some really, I think, important information in the book for newborns, for babies, for toddlers, for young kids, for adults, when to treat a fever, how to treat a fever, when to seek medical attention, as opposed to just reflexively thinking fever must use antipyretic, because again, that is often sabotaging one of your antiviral defenses. Right, because you said in the book that fever in itself is not an illness. No, fever is your body's response. I mean, the same way like your immune system produces cytokines to fight an infection, Fever is, and, it, and it's a response that has been preserved over millennia because it confers a survival advantage. And so fever is a response. It's your body's way of both letting you know something's going on and also fighting whether it's an infection, it's cancer, it's inflammation, et cetera. Yeah. Well, they've been saying for years that all disease begins and ends in the gut. Hippocrates was right. But you know, AJ, Hippocrates said something else that's really fascinating. And it's one of the opening quotes in the book. As you know, I start each chapter with a quote. And the very first one is also from Hippocrates. And it says, it is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than what sort of disease a person has. And what we see, if we look, for example, at autoimmune diseases, we see the people tend to have multiple. If we look at things like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, et cetera. These things travel in packs. Why? Because the root causes for many of these diseases is similar. It is, you know, it's the diet that's suboptimal. It's too many medications. It's not enough exposure to nature, et cetera. It's stress. It's not enough sleep. These things create multiple different diseases. So what Hippocrates was saying is it's, it's the way you're living 
that is often creating disease. And it's more important to really examine that we get back to health of the host than it is to think about necessarily the specific disease. Because the cool thing is that when you start attacking disease from root cause, whether that's dietary change, which is often foundational, as well as things like better sleep hygiene, stress management, et cetera, all these things often get better. You know, it's not just your blood pressure comes down, but your diabetes often resolves and, you know, your weight stabilizes and all these things. And I know, you know, firsthand what that's like, AJ, and making that change so that you are, you know, you are just a healthier host overall. Yeah. You know, I have to agree with you when you said you didn't like phlegm. 40 years ago, I was a respiratory therapist and I didn't like it either. And that was kind of my job. So I, so I totally get that. You know, I forgot that you were a respiratory therapist. That's absolutely I right. Know. And I just, I yeah. just didn't like suctioning. I just didn't want this. It just was not the good. And then the response you get, you know, if you're suctioning somebody on a ventilator and they often get that like reflux sort of coughing, hiccuping. I mean, it looks like you're inflicting trauma. I mean, of course you're doing something important, but Remember being in the ICU and thinking, yeah, like, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't look comfortable. Yeah. But it means you're probably very handy to have around if somebody's having any sort of airway distress. Yeah, somebody, right? You know, I actually had yeah. to believe it or not once in my life, I had to give mouth to mouth because there was no crash car. It was not a pleasant experience, but I know how to do it. And, and did the person survive? Yes, he did. He was actually amazing. A, he was, you know, the funny thing was, is yeah, he was a famous old time Western actor named Lash LaRue. And he thanked me for saving his life. So that was very, wow. yeah. I, was- I, I've had a, a couple of those. One was at a, a party out at the Eastern shore at someone's house. That was myself and a cardiothoracic surgeon um, who came out. I was changing into my swimsuit. So I will say I did come out in a, <laughs> a little bit of wardrobe malfunction to do this. And the gentleman, same thing, was really grateful. I mean, super, just unbelievably gratifying experience to to feel like you can intervene in that way. Absolutely. You know, Suzanne is mentioning you have a very impressive book collection behind you. (laughs) I do. And I have have my own little collection here with the first one. Gut Bliss. The second one, The Microbiome Solution, that took a lot of work getting my hair to do that. I love you. I love your hair the way it is right now, by the way. (laughs) Thank you. Well, this just primarily requires me to go like this in the morning. So it's a lot easier. Um, The Bloat Cure, which is the quickie A to Z, 101 things that bloat you. And then this last one, the antiviral gut. And you know, Sometimes I come in here, my, 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 I'm in my little home office and I do like, I just like to cuddle them and I like to hold them and think like, oh, I wrote all these books. And, and I have to tell you, it is, it's work for sure. But really what I think about when I think about the books is what a privilege it has been and how grateful I am to the folks, my imprint Avery at Penguin Random House. I've been with the same team for all four books. What a privilege it is to be able to not just put my nickel down as a someone who's been a physician for 30 years and knows a thing or two, but to put useful, practical, actionable information out into the world that's not, you know, there's no supplement I'm selling you here. I'm giving you information, a lot of it very basic around how to hydrate yourself. You know, your gut is a organ of detoxification and elimination, including elimination of viruses. So, you know, things that people might not think about, like the importance of hydration if you have a viral illness and getting that virus out of your body, um, you know, what sorts of foods to focus on as well as some of the things we might not think as much about like sleep and stress and so on. AJ, you know, I learned so much writing this book. I mean, the other, the first three books are all digestive wellness books and I live, breathe, eat and sleep that. But this one, like I went down a deep rabbit hole on sleep. I read some great sleep books, Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, Sean Stevenson's book, Sleep Better. And the data on sleep was fascinating. So if you look at vaccine efficacy, we know that people who are sleep deprived in the 48 hours before they receive a vaccine, the vaccine can be as much as 50% less efficacious. Crazy. And that's true for influenza, hepatitis, COVID vaccines. We know from uh, an article in the British Medical Journal that people who are chronically sleep deprived have as much as an 88% increased risk of COVID. So these are things that, you know, we take for granted, but, you know, we look at college students during exam time, they're stressed, 
We know stress can dramatically increase the numbers of pathogenic bacteria up to a thousand fold. So they're stressed, they're sleep deprived, and they're eating typically a lot of junk food around exam time. And what happens? They get viral illnesses. They get Epstein-Barr virus and mono, or they get bacterial infections, strep, et cetera, but they get sick. And that is not an accident. We have multiple studies dating back decades showing that we have a study from Carnegie Mellon that showed that if you expose healthy adults to coronavirus, not SARS-CoV-2, these studies were done over a decade ago, but to other types of coronavirus that are the cause of the common cold, that the ones who report chronic stress are the ones who are most likely after exposure to actually become infected and they get sicker, they miss more days of work, et cetera. We know that exercise is the most effective non-pharmaceutical intervention for the immune system. And again, we have data on people who are regular exercisers, not necessarily not getting sick, but having better outcomes, being less sick and having a shorter course of illness. So these things that you know are just seem basic, like things that our maybe grandparents would have told us are absolutely foundational to being more resilient. It's astounding to me, Dr. Chutkin, how few people really do regularly exercise. I think even more people eat healthfully than exercise. Their people just don't do it. You know, what's, what's interesting about that is I, I, I'm an avid exerciser and I'm probably exercising somewhere around four, five to seven days a week, a combination of vinyasa flow, yoga, lifting, running, various things. But in these last couple of years, when I've been working much more from home, less time at the hospital in the office, my ADLs, my activities of daily living has dropped a lot. So even though I'm getting in, you know, I'm going, I'm doing an hour of lifting or I'm going to my vinyasa flow yoga class today, during the day, I'm spending so much more time sitting than pre-pandemic where I would have been going back and forth, even in the office, out to the front to get the patient, bring them back across to the exam room, back into the office, back out front, running back and forth from the hospital to the office. So those, you know, I'm not a step counter, but if I were to count, um, I can just tell, like, I'm just expending much less energy during the day. And that's problematic because even though the actual exercise, you know, writ large is important, it's just that daily movement that is important too. And even standing desks and those things, you know, they help a little bit, but just moving around a lot less, I've, I've really felt that. So I'm, I've been excited as we're sort of transitioning back to more interaction, more movement, more running around. I'm looking forward to that. You know, I was looking at your books to see if I could identify any of them. And I see you have one of my favorite books, Salt, Sugar, and Fat by Michael Moss. And you have another book I have called Kind. We must have a lot of the same books. Yeah. That's and then I have, you know, like I have um, uh, um, the Robbins book, Diet for a New the America. Is, nice. Diet for a New America. I mean, there, I really, ha I brought a lot of these from my office and I really have to organize them because I have multiple shelves of primarily plant-based food, you know, T. Colin Campbell, et cetera. And then I have others and they're all just jumbled up and it makes it really difficult. Right, to let me tell you it, something. But... When you organize your books, your life will change. I literally just put them in alphabetical order after years of having them in color order because yeah. it's so pretty. They look good. Yeah. It looks so pretty okay. having the red books together, but then I could never find a book. So what do you recommend though, AJ? Do you recommend alphabetical or do you recommend by themes? So for example, I have a lot of running books. Alphabetical. Alphabetical? Because now the they, title of the book or the author? Um, oh, but the, the author, that's what I did. Cause it, last it, name or first name, last name. It's okay, like, so it, like a library. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, now I actually did it in two categories. I did all the plant-based books alphabetically and then things like, you know, I have books on dogs and astrology. And then I also yeah. did those alphabetical. So I have two sections, but I'm telling you my life changed since I, I alphabetized my books. I, I think I'm going to do by a section. I'm going to take your advice. I'm going to do by section, but alphabetical within the section. Yeah, you got to have the yeah. system. So <laughs> Here, here's a timely question from Monica, who's watching live. She says, how do we protect our gut from COVID as we're going into the holidays and we'll be around more people and probably eating more bad food than we eat the other 11 months of the year? So Monica, here's the thing. Exposure, as we have seen, is somewhat inevitable, right? I mean, if the both presidents can get this and, you know, our COVID czar, Dr. Fauci, people who are pretty well protected, if you will, um, 
you see that if you are living in the world and not, you know, just living at home the entire time, you, you are going to get exposed at some point. But so exposure may be inevitable, but illness is not inevitable. And infection, even if you are infected, the goal is asymptomatic or mild. We are trying to prevent people from getting really sick. And this is where these other issues about maintaining stomach acid, having an intact gut lining, that means not taking a lot of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, saying no to the ibuprofen, the aspirin, those drugs that poke little holes, being really judicious with the antibiotics, because we know that's going to kill off a lot of your healthy microbes. Thinking about the food, we know that these ultra processed foods that people are eating are literally damaging the gut lining. They're killing gut microbes. They're doing weird things in our gut. They're making us more susceptible. Um, so making sure that you're feeding your gut microbes, lots of healthy max microbiota accessible carbohydrates, think beans and greens, whole grains, et cetera. Sleep. We know that if we are sleep deprived, we are more susceptible. Even one night of poor sleep can make us more susceptible. Stress. We may not be able to change a stressful situation, but we can change our response to it. Just, you know, 10 deep breaths, some mindfulness, guided meditation, deep breathing. These are all things that can help tremendously. So these are things that we can do that can make a real difference. That could mean the difference between being really sick versus, you know, maybe having a sniffle for a day or two. So while avoidance is still a reasonable option, and that will go up and down, Rochelle Walensky, who's a director of the CDC, who I have the pleasure of knowing, described it as an umbrella, right? So she said, you take up things like masking and social distancing. When it's raining, you pull out the umbrella. So as they follow numbers and as things, numbers seem to go up, they may pull out the umbrella of masks back on, et cetera. But the thing that you can do all the time is you can be a healthier host. And I like to stress to people that, you know, I give a lot of different tips in here. The plan in this book is half the book, but I really want to go to chapter 13 because it's my favorite little chapter. So the whole second half of the book is all about, you know, the antiviral gut plan and all these things you can do. But let's go to chapter 13. Uh, let me find right it. I, plan, I got it. Plan at a glance. And you even have delicious recipes. Plan at, yeah, the recipes in this are fantastic from my friend, Elise Misella. She's done the recipes for all the books. But plan at a glance is, I say, I don't worry much about becoming infected with a virus. That doesn't mean I won't get sick. And in fact, I had COVID in January. But I channel any negative energy and anxiety about my health into positive actions that move me toward my goal of not getting sick. My system, my daily habits support my goal, not getting sick. As James Clare explains in his best-selling book, Atomic Habits, it's behind me on the wall, um, your system is what you do every day to get to your goal. Put another way, fix the inputs and the outputs will take care of themselves. When it comes to my goal of not getting sick from a virus, my system is pretty simple. Dirt, sweat, veg. Dirt, sweat, veg routine. I try to get outside in nature every day, work up a good sweat, and make sure I'm eating lots of vegetables. I don't worry about the details, like how long I'm outside for, whether I'm in the woods or just walking around the neighborhood, or what kind of exercise I'm doing, or how the vegetables are prepared. My system is just to make sure that I'm hitting all three on a daily basis. And of course, there are other things I do too, like paying attention to how much sleep I'm getting, my alcohol consumption, et cetera. But dirt, sweat, veg are my ride or die, my three things. I so what, what we are really trying to do, AJ, myself, James, Claire, everybody who's you know involved in, in all these endeavors of bringing you information is trying to get people to pay attention to these things that seem relatively small, but add up to make a big difference. And it's a consistency. It's not staying up till two o'clock every night and then sleeping in to try and pay down your sleep debt on a, on a Sunday night. It is being mindful about sleep hygiene and how important it is. It's not just for viruses, Alzheimer's, like dementia, poor sleep every week in my medical feed in the Washington Post or the New England Journal of Medicine, wherever you get your medical news, every week virtually. Last week in the Washington Post, there was an article about it, about how Poor sleep hygiene, which means either not enough hours of sleep or frequent interruptions, et cetera, 
is linked to an increased risk of dementia. These things are multifactorial. So it's really making these small little changes, trying to go to bed around the same time, wake up at the same time. Don't try and pay down that sleep debt on the weekend. That doesn't work. Consistently getting in some vegetables. For my patients in my practice, I tell them about the one, two, three rule, one vegetable breakfast, two at lunch, three at dinner. That gets in six servings a day. And I don't really focus so much on what else they're eating. I mean, I do tell them keep the ultra processed foods less than 10%, but it, it's not about like policing the diet and, oh, you know, you had this and that's terrible. You've got to go to food jail. It's really encouraging them to add in the things that they're missing. And what are most Americans missing? Vegetables. They're missing plants, vegetables in particular. So this, the numbers are astounding. Like less than 1% of Americans are eating fruit every day. Um, less than 7% are getting the recommended amounts of beans and greens. And AJ, you know, it's like people will do anything to avoid eating a vegetable. They'll drink these ridiculous green powder oh. potion. I'm like, what is that? That's been sitting on a shelf in a factory for six months. That is not a vegetable. That is an edible food-like substance. Like just go eat a carrot. You know, what, what is it, AJ? Why do people have such an aversion to vegetables? Okay, I have a theory. It's because of yeah, food addiction because it, because the they are so low in calorie density, even though they're high in nutrient density, that they don't produce very much pleasure or dopamine. And, and your quote, yeah. what you just said, people will do anything to avoid eating a vegetable. Yes, another t-shirt. It's so true. Well, another great plant eater, my friend, Neil Barnard, who I know we're both huge fans of and his work with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, his one of his early books, Breaking the Food Seduction, he talks about the dopamine receptors, the chocolate and the cheese and the meat and all of that. So you're right, you don't get that dopamine hit. And after a while, the good stuff just gets crowded out, right? You're eating the ultra processed foods that are engineered with the salt and the sugar and fat to, you know, feel pleasurable and they have the mouth feel and the palate. And then you eat something, you know, maybe a little bit bitter and it's just like, ah, oh, where is the salt and the sugar and the fat? So we do have to train our palates. And that's why that one, two, three rule, even if you're eating the other stuff, start yeah. doing the one, two, three rule one and veggie specifically that one veggie at breakfast, two at lunch, three at dinner. And over time, the palate will start to shift and you know, the microbes start to shift too. I know you know this, AJ, that as you feed your gut microbes different things, then you see the population of the good guys, the Fecalobacteria prosnitzii that are churning out those short chain fatty acids, the population will start to increase and you'll see the yeast species and others start to decrease. So we can, we can definitely make those changes to our palate. But as we used to say to our daughter when she was little, you don't need to like it. You just need to eat it. Absolutely. You know, it's a little bit of that in the beginning, right? I, I, I couldn't agree for more. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. And if you keep doing it, you'll learn to like it. you learn to like it. Just it's like, like, it's like medicine. It's like exercise. Exercise. I mean, I, I crave exercise for sure. But um, I also grew up in a household. My parents, who are 82 and 87, still avid exercisers um, every day. Like if we didn't break a sweat, it was sort of like frowned upon. So, I mean, they were much more concerned about whether we were running around outside and getting dirty and getting exercise than the grades. I mean, you know, the grades are important too, but uh, you know, my dad would be like, oh, it's four o'clock. You haven't done anything yet. Go outside and get dirty and, and take your shoes off. So they really, they really promoted that. But what, what's really interesting too, about these acquired tastes for things is just as you get the negative feedback, I, I really encourage people to think about not how something feels when you're doing it, but also after, after. Exercise for me doesn't always feel good when I'm doing it, but invariably after feels amazing. Um, sleep, you know, getting into bed early, sort of like, oh, I've got all these things to do. I don't want to get into bed. But then you wake up the next day and you're like, wow, that was amazing. So same thing versus the things that maybe feel great when you're doing them, like, I don't know, the ultra processed food or whatever, but then you feel bad after. So you have to pay attention to both. And there are definitely things that feel good both ways, right? Like yoga to me feels good when I'm doing it and after, but think about those things where after you have that buyer's remorse, you're like, oh, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. I'm hung over, whatever it is. And, you know, we have the capacity to just habituate to that. And that becomes the new normal. 
But I want you to reject that. You're supposed to feel good. You're not supposed to feel tired and cranky and stiff and whatever else it is, right? And to really seek out those things that are going to give you that afterglow feeling of like, wow, I feel fantastic. I want to do that again. And I think that's true of vegetables. That after a while, you know, I know we've been on vacation sometimes like ski holidays where, you know, it's a lot of fries and not great food. And I'm just like, oh, I cannot wait for a big green leafy salad and something that's not fried. And you really, you really do crave it. Absolutely. Well, I want to just put a shout out for the audible version of the antiviral gut because you read it and you did a fabulous job in your own voice. And one of the things that really blew my mind in the book is when you said that our microbes actually determine whether we're fat or thin. How's that possible? Yeah, we can determine obesity with much more accuracy looking at the microbiome than looking at genes, because it really, while the genes can influence things one way or the other, it's ultimately the microbes that tend to determine the expression. So some of this stuff is, you know, there's a lot of pressure right now, if you will, to draw straight lines between the microbe, this microbe equal this disease and this microbe equal that disease. And we definitely are not at that point, nor I think will we ever be because just like as people, we have many different aspects to us. Sometimes I'm very good. And sometimes I'm a little bit bad. You know, we're not the same thing. Bacteria aren't always good or always bad. They can make different products depending on the um, hormonal metabolic milieu they're in, et cetera. So we have to look beyond just the species and also look at this idea of metabolomics and what are the bacteria actually making and why, and is this a cause of the disease or is this an effect of the disease? But if you look at, for example, the, the main families of gut bacteria, there are four main families that we call phyla in humans. And that's from micutes, bacteroidetes, proteobacteria, and, um, well, those three would be the, the top three. And so if we look at Formicates and Bacteroidetes, what we see is that historically and sort of evolutionarily, people in northern climates where there were long winters, and we're talking, you know, thousands of years ago before refrigeration and cooking and so on. So people had to survive long winters without a lot of food. And they tended to have a lot of Formicates because Formicates were good at storing calories as fat. So that was actually something that conferred a survival benefit so that you didn't starve over the long winter when there was a lack of food. Well, now there's plenty of food over the winter. So having a lot of formicates and being able to store fat is not necessarily such a, a good and healthy thing, but it is, again, it developed as an evolutionary adaptation to something. And so what we see, for example, is um, high levels of, again, Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, that very important bacteria that ferments fibrous plant foods into short-chain fatty acids. That is associated with lower rates of autoimmune disease, et cetera, lower levels of obesity. This is the most prevalent bacteria in vegans. It's associated with lower rates of colon cancer metabolic disease, heart disease. But again, you can't just go borrow some F. prosnitzii from AJ. Like AJ, you probably have tons of F. prosnitzii. Let me borrow some of your stool. Let me shoot it up my bum and like presto, right? I No, you, you can't do that and like feed F. prosnitzii cheeseburgers and Cheetos. We have to do what AJ is doing. We've got to eat a lot of plants if we want to cultivate that healthy population of F. prosnitzii. So there's no hacking the microbiome, you know? Bacteria, like you can't outhack your microbes. You really have to have to do the work. But again, it doesn't mean you can never eat something that's maybe not so great for the microbiome, but you have to include, you have to include those healthy foods. So what we see, I mean, there is a, a fascinating study from this Italian pediatric gastroenterologist named Paolo Leonetti. And I talk about this study a lot because it really is foundational in the microbiome research world. So Paolo Leonetti, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist practicing in Florence, Italy, did a study over a decade ago where he took a group of babies in Florence, Italy, and a similar group age-wise in Bullpon, Burkina Faso. Now, the kids in Florence, Italy, very similar diet to the standard American diet, lots of fat and sugar and low fiber. 
The kids in Bulpa and Burkina Faso, these are children from the Mossi ethnic tribe who are living in very similar conditions, very similar way of life to their Neolithic ancestors. They're living in communities with huts, with dirt on the floor. They live in close proximity to the animals and they eat primarily a high fiber diet. The occasional termite during the rainy season, occasional chicken, but is overwhelmingly a plant-based diet. And what they found, AJ, is that at birth and in early toddlerhood, babies in both Florence and Burkina Faso who are vaginally born and breastfed were virtually identical in terms of the microbes. But as soon as the kids graduated to table food, everything changed. The kids in Italy eating the, you know, ossobuco gelato diet, they had microbes that are associated with obesity, with inflammation. They had half the levels of those really important short chain fatty acids. And the kids in Burkina Faso, in Bopan, eating the high fiber diet, lots of, um, lots of root vegetables, et cetera, they had double the levels of short chain fatty acids and they had species associated with leanness, et cetera. Now, the really fascinating part of this study is that neither group of children were sick. We're talking about healthy toddlers, but we were already seeing the foundations, the microbial foundations for disease being laid down early in these two different groups of people. And so we are, you know, we are just setting ourselves up. And if we look at Italy, Italy has higher rates of obesity, childhood obesity and heart disease than the US. And it's because nobody's eating a Mediterranean diet in Italy anymore. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but um, because the standard American diet and a diet of ultra processed food that's high in dairy, high in sugar, high in fat, high in processed carbohydrates is has become much more standard there than how people sort of historically ate in Italy. And as a result, they're seeing a lot more of these diseases and they're seeing the microbial changes. So this stuff is laid down early. But the other thing I want to remind people, it's never too late to make a change because we know that within about 30 hours of food hitting your gut, the microbiome starts to change, not just the different bacteria, but also the different genes we see turned on and off. And so you could have been eating gelato and asabuco your whole life and you decide now, today, you know, December 6th, you're making a change. By December 8th, we can start to see these positive changes in your microbiome. I mean, what a message of optimism. We can literally change our future, our health future by changing the choices we make about what we eat and how we live. I mean, if that's not good news, I don't know what is. That is great. Well, that is fantastic. And thank you for this wonderful book, guys. Check out the link below in the chat and in the show notes. I love the audible version. It's read by Dr. Chutkin herself. And if you send your receipt into the link that's in the show notes, you can take a three hour masterclass with her next yes. year. AJ, thank you so much for mentioning that as part of this sort of ongoing public service announcement about this stuff. I wanted to make the information really accessible. So we originally created it as a pre-order incentive is this free antiviral gut masterclass. It's going to be February 7th, but we have it ongoing and it's open to everyone and you have to upload proof of purchase. Don't tell the folks at Penguin Random House if you literally take a picture of the book and upload it. We don't care. We're not checking. We want people to do this class. I've assembled this incredible group of experts. I'm actually taping one of the interviews right after this with an incredible radiologist. These are my medical colleagues. These are experts who you don't see on social media because they're busy actually taking care of patients pulmonology, rheumatology, radiology, infectious disease. I have my friend Light Watkins, who's an incredible meditation expert. Um, so many great experts talking about what we need to know about viruses, how to increase our resilience and decrease our susceptibility, what to do about post-viral syndromes and just really great clinical experience. So I hope you'll sign up and join us on February 7th for that. Well, I did and I'll be there. And Randy is commenting, you are just so amazing with your knowledge. Thank you so much, Dr. Chutkin. This was fantastic. This was great, AJ. It's always such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for a 